The first thing I'd like to do is thank my collaborators who are listed here. These are the people that helped me with the dust part of the exhibit tonight. And uh, one of my collaborators is at the back, Dave Gardner. And I'd also like to thank the uh, Health Canada and NSERC for funding the, uh, the house dust research. What I've shown here is a photograph of house dust. It's familiar to all of us. This is an example of, a, of how we air dry house dust. And you can see the usual components here, lots of hair, some leaves and twigs from outside, some fiber and wood, and then a whole lot of this light, fluffy material. And that's what I've been studying for the last 10 years. And uh, most people think of that light, fluffy stuff as largely skin flakes and um, di dust mites and e dust excrement. But we're looking at the mineralogy and the chemistry of that dust. And it's, it shows that house dust is a whole lot more interesting than just dust mites. The house dust represents what we do in our homes. It varies depending on the age of the house, the building materials in the house, our hobbies, the consumer products that we bring into the house, how many pets there are, how many people there are. And all of those things contribute to the variability of house dust. Why we started uh, becoming interested in house dust at Health Canada is because children are exposed to metals by ingesting or swallowing house dust. And children do this normally, just their normal hand-to-mouth activities. They accidentally swallow house dust. And we know that doing so is a key source of exposure to lead. And lead is of concern because it's a, a neurotoxin. It affects the neur neurological system. Um, large studies in the U United Kingdom <coughs> and in the USA in the 80s and 90s proved that ingesting house dust is a source of lead because they looked at correlations between elevated levels of lead in house dust and elevated levels of lead in, in children's blood. So we know it's a real pathway of exposure. The, um, <clears throat> there's not a lot known, however, about other metals in house dust, or there wasn't at the time we started. So when we began our work, this was this this is an example of our research from 2001. That's the, the publication at the bottom. We compared uh, vacuum dust taken from inside 50 homes in Ottawa with garden soil that was uh, taken from the same homes, <coughs> and then street dust that was collected from outside the, the garden. So that, on the y-axis here, is the concentration of lead in those materials in parts per million or micrograms per gram. And we were very surprised to see that on average the lead concentration in the house dust was five times higher than the lead concentration in the soil or the street dust. And that came out again and again in, in, in when we did repeat surveys. Similarly, nickel was higher in the house dust than in the garden soil and street dust. In this case, in, in the Ottawa study, it was about um, three times higher. And cadmium was higher also in house dust compared to out, outdoor soil and street dust. So this is actually about 16 times higher. That's the geometric mean. So this led us to doing the Canadian house dust study, um, I, wanted to, I want to emphasize with, those, with that pilot study that um, Ottawa, what we were sampling on Ottawa was a non-industrial residential parts of the city. Where, where houses are located next to contaminated sites, especially metal contaminated sites, the reverse is the case. The soil has higher concentrations of metals than the indoor dust. But in, the, in Ottawa, the indoor dust had its own unique chemical profile. It wasn't anything like the soil. 
And the um, other metals were elevated as well, copper and, and uh, zinc as well as lead, antimony, mercury, were all many times higher. And these are the metals that are toxicologically of concern. The, the, when we launched the Canadian House Dust Study, the goal was to get a nationally representative measure, an estimate of typical co chemical concentrations in Canadian urban homes. We started off with lead as our first priority, and then we're now looking at other metals and organic compounds. So this is how, this map shows how we went about with this, this st sampling. Um, our statisticians at Health Canada <coughs> uh, designed a random sample, and we looked at cities with a population above 100,000 people. And this is because 80% of Canadians live in cities above 100,000 people. And at the time we designed the study in 2005, 2006, there were 40 cities with population above 100,000. And out of those 40 cities, 13 cities were randomly sampled across the country to get uh, a representative sample. We sampled 1,025 homes from those 13 cities altogether. And we sampled in the winter time. It took four years to collect dust from all of those homes. So we did three cities a year and then four cities in the final year. On the right is the uh, huge vacuum sampler that we used for the Canadian house dust study. Um, I just showed for your interest, for the pilot study, we use this thing. They're, they're, uh, this is a small, small area sampler that's used for individual rooms. But for the Canadian house dust study, we wanted to sample the entire house, at least all the dry living areas in the house, because we wanted to get a representative whole house sample. We immediately but when the uh, vacuum samples came back to Health Canada, we immediately stored them in the refrigerator because they're full of bacteria and that would destroy the integrity of the sample. So everything was frozen right away. And then after we um, uh, dried and processed the samples, we again returned them to the freezer. This picture here shows how our technicians protected themselves because who knows what is in these house dust samples. So. They were well protected as they dealt with it. And this is Tessa, she's opening up and cutting open a vacuum bag. And then this is uh, the way we air dried the vacuum samples. And uh, uh, yes, and then th these you'll, you recognize probably the bottles from, from the display. So after we air dried the samples, we sieve them into different size fractions. and. Um, this sieve here contains dust that's 80, 80 microns to 300 microns in that range. And that's the size fraction that we looked at for to look at the mineralogy. And the, you saw the photos perhaps out in the, in the exhibit. Those were taken by Michael. He's a master's student at University of Ottawa. And he will be delighted to see how beautifully those are exhibited there remarkably attractive photos considering its house dust. One of the common minerals was, uh, that we found was quartz, quartz minerals that are tracked in from outside. And we realized that we were sampling in the winter. So this was sand that had been used to de-ice the roads or uh, for ice control in the roads that had been tracked in. So that's why we found uh, beautiful quartz crystals at the microscopic level all across the Ontario cities. This uh, sieve on the right contains the fine fraction, less than 80 microns. That's what we used for chemical analysis. And the top one is the reject. That's the coarse stuff that eventually we threw away. So this is the instrument that we use to measure um, the metals, it's called an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, or ICPMS for short. And uh, we analyzed the uh, dust for a wide range of elements, not just lead, just about, about 
68 elements altogether. When we went around to uh, each city to sample, ahead of time, before we sent out letters of invitation to recruit participants, we went to the city officials in each, in each place to let them know that we were coming. And um, we also, uh, as soon as we got our lead results, we informed the participants what their lead, lead in the dust concentration was, and we also gave them advice on how to minimize exposure. The, uh, um, I can't read it. Yes, the, those participants that had elevated dust lead levels, we also felt that if, if some follow-up was needed, that they should go to the public health authority or, or to their family doctor to get uh, blood lead tested. The, uh, we gave um, this booklet that's shown here to every participant. It's a booklet that's available on the internet if you look at the Health Canada website or the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation website. It's a joint publication describing sources of lead in the home and how to minimize exposure. And the uh, participants and the cities all responded very positively. People are really interested in the indoor environment and contamination levels and appreciated the information. What we found in the house dust was many, many sources of lead contribute to house dust. One, in older homes especially, uh, lead pigment is, and, and uh, the white pigment in, in older homes is often either lead carbonate or lead sulfate. And in uh, pre-World War II homes, this, the lead paint was sometimes 50% lead, uh, lead content. So it's not surprising the dust was elevated in lead. But even in modern homes, we find lead pigments um, because it still exists in artist paints and hobby paints and so on. And lead is also used as a drying agent a stabilizer, an extender, so it's, it's used for other purposes other than just pigments. Um, and it's found in plastics like and PVC vinyl as well. We also found compounds of lead that indicated that lead had been tracked in for, with soil particles. And uh, the other type of lead we found was lead methyl. Uh, in one place, we, we could track it to lead solder. We actually found the globules of solder. And this was a, a family who was extremely careful about the products they brought into the home, but they had not cleaned up after, just after their most recent project, and, and we found a 3,000 parts per million lead in their house dust. Um, there were also lead metal particles that we, it was very difficult to identify. But there's a large number of different sources, and you've probably heard in the media reports of lead in children's toys and jewelry. Um, so that can easily get ground up and into house dust. For those that are interested, this study's been published just recently in May 2011. And uh, this is just a few numbers for those uh, of details. Across that top, row there, those numbers add up to 1,025 homes. And nine, 924 of those, or 90%, had less than, um, less than 250 parts per million, or micrograms per gram in the dust. So we call that group background. And then those homes that had above 250 parts per million, we called elevated. And then a small proportion, about 3%, had anomalous levels, uh, very, very elevated levels of lead. Um, notice here the year built, uh, the, that's the, how, the age of the home. The younger homes, 1969 on average, were in the background. But as we get into the elevated and anomalous categories of lead, dust lead, the uh, homes were uh, quite a bit older. Uh, the average age was 1918, average year of, of, of being built for the anomalous homes. As, as a general rule, house age, um, the older the home, the higher the dust lead, 
but there are exceptions. And we found actually uh, about 10% of the homes in the elevated and anomalous category were built after 1980. So that shows that there's other sources of lead other than old paint that's getting into people's house dust. One of the important things, we wanted to take a look at, at the anomalous category because those are the homes that need attention. And it was interesting to note that the participants reported in the case of the anomalous category, 71% had done renovations in the past year. So we think that what happened was that the lead paint was loosened and got into the dust during the renovations and didn't get properly cleaned up. And linked to the fact that the old, older homes had higher lead, the older city core, a lot of the anomalous homes are located in city cores, whereas the background homes were uh, only 25% were located in city cores. So to summarize then, the, um, the, we have a statistical baseline for lead and we're moving on to having a statistical baseline for other, other um, um, metals and organic compounds. And by that I mean a representative sample, a res representative estimate of typical Canadian house dust. 90% fell into the background category, less than 250 and 10% were above 250 parts per million. In the older homes, the, the most common com lead compound was paint pigments, especially lead carbonate. But in the younger homes, there were a variety of lead compounds, including solder and lead metal from, from other consumer products. The, uh, the study results show the importance of keeping dust levels down in uh, especially during renovation activity in order to reduce exposure to lead. And there's also evidence in the house dust of, of lead being tracked in from outdoors. And again, removing boots and shoes at the, at the door and, and, and vacuuming and, and, and dry mopping helps reduce the exposure to that source. So finally, I wanted to show you our own collection of of things that we found in the coarse fraction. That was in the reject fraction. Uh, the, the team, as, we, as they processed that 1,025 homes, picked out the little gems that we found. In one case, we found a gold necklace. We returned that to the, to the homeowner. But um, it re it's a reminder of the variety of things that at, the, at the macroscopic scale that we see, but it's, it, even in the very microscopic level, we see organics, we see plastics, we see metals. One house had a I am Canadian beer cap, so we know that's the Canadian house dust study, and textiles.